Hi everybody. Recording this video tour today. It was going to be a live stream tour, but subject to the exigencies of Verizon service here at Gettysburg, we've encountered this before when we walk picket to charge. A little spot that I'm in at the moment, as you can see, the background here, it's oh, bang the tripod. Really professional, David. As you can see in the background there, that's Herbst Woods up on McPherson's Ridge. And the farmland between um, here and in front of me, at the top of Seminary Ridge, is the Lutheran Theological Seminary. So I'm kind of probably in a, in a, in a dead zone here in some low ground, and that may be my own fault why I don't have network connectivity down here. So with that being said, I decided that what I would do is just do an offline recording today of a battlefield tour. Um, get across the information in this offline recording and that will give me an opportunity to upload that to Facebook and upload that to YouTube and all the other places as well. Um, I might even be able to break some clips out of this and uh, upload some information to TikTok um, in short segments. So thank you for joining me today. I'm sorry it's not live, I'm sorry it's recording but um, this is always my fallback position is if I have a network problem I have to drop the live feed because it's not working. Um, I will do a static recording, an offline recording, and upload that. So this is the backup for that. So as I say, we're out at Gettysburg today, and we're talking about the first day of battle, July the 1st, 1863. Uh, we've covered uh, some of that history before in other talks, and we've actually walked some of this ground before. The ground behind me, you may remember from a... Um, talk about the Iron Brigade and in particular the 6th Wisconsin under Rufus Dawes. We were actually back in that very field back there and we walked from there to the railroad cut. So this is familiar territory for a lot of us and if you visited um, Gettysburg before and you've taken the auto tour, um, right back across there is auto tour stop number one with John Reynolds. So um, this is, as I say, familiar ground to some of us. So today I wanted to talk about um, Union First Corps, that first corps of infantry that arrives on the field mid-morning under the command of Major General John Reynolds commanding that corps. I want to talk about that infantry and specifically I'm going to pull out of that corps one regiment and talk about one individual single regiment in the infantry corps. I'll talk about the 151st Pennsylvania. Um, it's become known to us as the School Teachers Regiment. It was not known as that at the time, it was just simply known as the 151st Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Um, it's become known as the School Teachers Regiment around about the 1930s um, as research into the Civil War coming up for its anniversaries increased. Um, the 151st Pennsylvania, when you look at the muster rolls, um, it was believed that there were upwards of 100 school teachers serving with the regiment when it was mustered in. So when that regiment was mustered in a thousand strong in 1862, um, they're saying that like around 100 men, 60 to 100 men, accounts vary, were school teachers. Now whether that's actually accurate or not, we don't know, um, because not all of the information is known on who the men were that mustered into this regiment and what their backgrounds were. What we do know is that Company D in particular, raised in Juniata County, Pennsylvania, um, Company D, almost its entire strength, was recruited from the faculty and student body of McAllister Academy, no, sorry, McAllisterville Academy, which was a teacher training college, teacher training school. Um, the principal of that college, Professor George McFarland, resigned from the college and took a commission as Captain George McFarland commanding D Company of the regiment, so around about a hundred men in D Company were members of either the faculty or the student body. So there is a strong academic background, there is a strong school teacher flavour to the regiment through Company D. Now McFarland would not remain a captain, he would eventually be promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, and Lieutenant Colonel McFarland, uh, McFarland was in command of the regiment here at Gettysburg on the first day of battle, July 1st, 1863. So in Bates' History of the Pennsylvania Volunteers, in Bates' History of the Pennsylvania Volunteers, he states that the majority of the regiment was in general excellent. Many of the men were experienced marksmen and most of them well-formed and hardy. 
Um, so a lot of these men were farmers. Um, the regiment was recruited from different parts of Pennsylvania, from the uh, Allegheny Forest to the Delaware Water Gap, um, down to farmland in uh, uh, Barks County and um, Schuylkill County and around the suburbs of Pennsylvania, but predominantly farmers from farm country. So a lot of them bought, as he said, well-formed and hardy. They were um, fit and healthy men from working outdoors, and a lot of them, um, although not trained in an 1861 <laughs> Springfield rifled musket, um, at least knew how to, uh, um, you know, hunt rabbits and hunt deer and so forth. So um, use of firearms was not a new thing to them that it may have been to some city regiments where there was no experience of that. These are men that had had fouling pieces and shotguns and hunting rifles. So they were familiar with firearms. They may not have been the best shots in the world, but that would be drilled into them once they joined and once they were issued with their muskets and became an organized body. Now the 151st, was raised in 1862, so second year of the war. It is raised as a nine-month regiment of volunteers, so some regiments, as you know, are raised for a year, three years, the duration of the war. Some are raised for a short period, and this is a regiment raised for nine months. It is in direct response to Lee's invasion of the North in 1862, which results in the Battle of Antietam at Sharpsburg, Maryland. And as a result of that invasion of the North, there's a little bit of panic in the North and a request goes out to raise additional regiments. So one of the additional regiments raised as a result of that panic of 1862 is the 151st Pennsylvania. They are mustered into federal service. Um, the men are sworn into federal service between October and November of 1862 and for nine months service only. So by the time the Battle of Gettysburg rolls around, in July of 1863, uh, these men are nearing the end of their enlistment. Um, this would be the point if it was me, I would say, guys, I have 30 days left to serve, and I know there's a battle coming, but I would very much like to not die, I would like to go home, so um, if you don't mind, can we sit this one out? Can we like go guard the baggage train or um, guard the line of communications? We don't really want to be in this. But the men of the 151st did not do that and did not say that. Um, they did not shirk their duty. Um, instead, they marched into battle that morning with the rest of First Corps, despite their enlistments only having a few weeks left to go. So the 151st formed part of 1st Brigade, so that's um, Brigadier General Rowley's Brigade in 3rd Division, so that's Major General Doubleday's Division in 1st Corps. Major General John Reynolds Corps. So they're a single regiment in that brigade. Um, when they come to the battlefield that morning they number 467 men in total. Um, so that's slightly below half strength and they mustered in into federal service in October of 62, approximately a thousand strong. So we're now talking um, eight to nine months later. Um, very few men have seen um, uh, combat. They haven't really been heavily engaged in combat during that period. They lost 16 men at the Battle of Chancellorsville, but that's a small number when you think about it. So other men have been lost to disease and sickness, um, invalided home, um, died of disease or sickness, men are absent on furlough, uh, men that had been mustered in early had already been mustered out of the regiment. The regiment is down from where it could have been a thousand men, and it would have been a thousand men when all these regiments were mustered into service on day one. Uh, is down to 467 men, which is not a bad number. Um, that's quite a decent sized regiment for um, Union regiments in service here at Gettysburg. 467 men. So as I said, part of Rowley's brigade. Now, as we know from prior tours, and some of you may have seen the Gettysburg movie, obviously, um, when John Reynolds arrives on the scene as a Major General Commanding First Corps, he rides to the front to encourage the men and he gets very close to the firing line behind me there at Herbst Woods. Um, and he is mortally wounded, falls from his horse, mortally wounded and killed here on the battlefield. Now, chain of command takes effect. Um, command of First Corps will now devolve to the senior major general in the corps, senior divisional commander, which happens to be Abner Doubleday. So Abner Doubleday, we remember him, um, served in the opening engagement of the war at Fort Sumter, Abner Doubleday was second in command at Fort Sumter, 
Um, we also know the, the folklore legend of uh, Abner Doubleday inventing baseball, which of course he did not. But So we know who Abner Doubleday is. And here's the senior major general in first corps, and he takes command of the corps. So when he takes command of the corps, somebody has to move up and take command of his division. And Rowley, as the senior brigadier general, moves up to take command of third division, which means, of course, there's now a vacancy to command um, the brigade. And that passes over to Colonel Chapman Biddle, who moves up to brigade command that day. So it's been like a, a movement in the command structure um, within First Corps that morning. In McFarlane's report of the battle itself, so McFarlane submits a report of the battle, um, not in 1863. Um, he's wounded and captured and taken prisoner and he's not paroled so he doesn't write his official report until 1864 when he's finally paroled from Libby prison and returned um, to uh, Union service but he writes in his um, action report of the morning of the Battle of Gettysburg that the regiment advanced that morning six miles from Emmitsburg so they came in from Emmitsburg and they formed line of battle on the left flank of first corps so I'm facing kind of opposite to the way they would be facing. They would be facing Herbst Woods. And this way is the right flank, and this way is the left flank. So Rowley's brigade forms to this far left side of um, first corps line of battle. They said they brought with them 467 men onto the battlefield that morning, 21 officers, uh, 446 enlisted men. Um, in his diary, Lieutenant Charles Potts of I Company records that they marched from Emmitsburg to Gettysburg without halt, so six miles doesn't seem like a lot, but you know, when you're carrying a lot of equipment and a musket and a uh, heavy wool uniform, um, and they actually believe I mar they marched to a rain school that morning. And so as soon as that rain school quick cleared, the sun came out and it had hit with horrendous humidity. So they walked six miles down this dirt road from Emmitsburg and they went straight into the fight. There was no time for them to the rest. The brigade had to deploy straight into line of battle. Um, and then also then that um, history of Pennsylvania volunteers, Samuel Bates said that they received the news, Rowley received the news of uh, the unfortunate uh, fall of Reynolds and that the change of command and that they moved into line swiftly. Now the men of the 151st came in through, let me just see if I can just throw the camera around a little bit there, to the Lutheran Theological Seminary itself. They came in through the Union Theological Seminary grounds, they unslung their packs, they packed their packs as they moved into battle, so let's see something less to carry. And they moved into position here just below the Theological Seminary, they moved into position just below the Theological Seminary in support of Cooper's Artillery Battery. So that's um, Battery B, 1st Pennsylvania Light Artillery, um, four three-inch ordnance rifles, had an artillery position here. And the 151st initially were assigned um, to support the artillery battery. So not move into the firing line and engage the Confederate infantry, but to remain here in support of the artillery. Now the battery would have to change fronts several times during the morning and early afternoon to meet different threats. We have the Confederate force of infantry, Harry Heth's division, and the rest of A.P. Hill's corps coming to us from this direction. But out here on our flank, um, towards Oak Hill, Richard Ewell's uh, corps, second corps, is now arriving on the field and Rhodes will establish his division on Oak Hill and get some artillery up there, which will start shelling this position as well. So the Union batteries here will have to change front several times, firing in support of First Corps in their direct attack here against um, AP Hills Corps as that's coming up, and then also in support of holding off Wadsworth's division will move up this way to hold off Rhodes, and the, the batteries have to keep changing front during the morning. And McFarlane notes that they held this position in support of the infantry, in support of the artillery, um, for about two and a half hours. So under shot and shell for two and a half hours. And Lieutenant Potts, in his diary, he notes that it was careful fighting on both sides. So this was not mad charging around and men not knowing what they do. Men kept order. 
the regiments on both sides kept order, kept unit cohesion, nobody was breaking, everybody kept formation, everybody kept line of battle, everybody behaved as if it was on an exercise. It was a very careful and deliberate fighting here as each army then manoeuvred for advantage, each army manoeuvred for a slight open flank or a slight rising ground in which it could bring um, infantry around on a flank or it could bring an artillery piece up onto a slight rise of ground to gain an advantage. And throughout that two and a half hour period, each army was manoeuvring for that advantage, pushing backwards, coming forwards, etc., etc., gaining ground, taking ground, and then also giving ground up and then trying to retake that ground. So back there in Herb's Woods, the Iron Brigade has been slogging away since the morning. The first, the first Union infantry to arrive on the scene have been the Iron Brigade. They are still fighting there at Herb's Woods. Other brigades have come up in support of them. Rowley will move the rest of his brigade. He will leave the 151st here, but he will order the rest of the, the, that brigade forward in support of the Iron Brigade. We have Cutler's Brigade over here at the railroad cutting. We have Wadsworth's division extended out on the line there to our to our um, to the Union's um, right flank. So the fighting is engaging and the 151st is still in a defensive position. So the rest of Harry Heth's division is coming up this road here, coming up Cashtown Pike. Um, we've had a conf confrontation with Archer's and Davis's brigades, but we now have additional brigades coming into play. Pettigrew's brigade is on the field, Brockenborough's brigade is on the field. Um, Pender's division is moving up behind Heth with Perrin and Scales, so the pressure of Confederate infantry is telling and starting to drive 1st Corps units back, slowly backwards. They're not fleeing, they're not breaking, they're not running, they're fighting in good order as Potts said. Careful fighting. So the situation though does become increasingly fluid um, during the early afternoon and events now begin to unfold very quickly because there is fighting with the 11th Corps to the north of town against um, Richard Ewell's 2nd Corps. So the 11th Union Corps um, sent forward by Oliver Otis Howard is coming under terrible pressure. They only have two divisions in place and they're coming under terrible pressure and taking terrible casualties there and they are also being pushed back towards the town itself by an overwhelming Confederate force and so I said events begin to unfold very very quickly. So around two o'clock in the afternoon um, no longer supporting Cooper's artillery battery the 151st take a position slightly below the seminary itself um, so not in the seminary buildings they don't like you know they're not going to street fight they're not going to loophole the windows and pile up chairs and start fighting fr fighting from the buildings themselves um, street fighting is not really a thing in the Civil War um, when you get an occasion where it does occur, such as the Battle of Fredericksburg, when the Union infantry move into the town of Fredericksburg and are driving Barksdale's Mississippians out of the town house by house, so the Irish Brigade, for example, you know, and, and fighting house by house through the town, um, that's an exception. That's, that's something that really doesn't happen that often. So the 151st moved to a position just below the ridge. They moved to defend the military crest. And they establish a breastworks and um, they have to use the material that they have to hand. The material that they have to hand to establish a defensive position is a line of trees. Um, they pull down some rail fences and start piling up the split rails from those fences um, to make a crude breastworks. If they can find a tree trunk, if they can find a, a fallen tree limb, whatever they can find they're going to pile up to make a small defensive semi-circular position below the seminary and that will be um, they believe the fullback position for First Corps. They are now a single regiment and they are the only regiment in reserve for First Corps. Every other unit in First Corps is now engaged on the field and the 151st Pennsylvania is the reserve for the entire Corps. So if anything happens, if a gap opens in the line, if the Confederates try to make a breakthrough, the 151st are going to have to fill that gap. And that is exactly what happens. It's a single regiment at that point holding a flimsy barricade and they are the um, last best hope of First Corps. So a gap in the Union line opens up between Wadsworth's division and Rowley's division and that gap's got to be filled because Pettigrew's brigade, uh, Confederate brigade, is going to pour right through that gap between um, 
the two divisions. Now the gap between the two divisions is over there. There's a gap opens up and Pettigrew's brigade is going to come storming through that gap unless something can be done. Rowley orders the 151st forward. Those 467 men leave their little barricade there. They come down the hill. They cross this ground behind me as you can see. It's a uh, nicely mowed grass here because I'm still on the I'm still on the grounds of the seminary here um, technically I'm down by their, um, their water pumping house um, so as you can see right behind me here is a, is a brown patch that's actually weed at the moment there's a, it's boggy ground there it's low-lying ground there's a slight water course and stream runs through there um, which is where the college is pumping the water from so if you cross that you can see the fields beyond that um, it's a soybean field and a corn field this year. It's been wheat fields in other years that I've been here. So there's two fields behind me and then Herb's Woods. So the 151st has to come down this hill, cross that ground and up onto McPherson's Ridge where they're going to take position on McPherson's Ridge and fill that gap between Wadsworth's and Rowley. So as they move up and they close that interval, stem the tear, stem that Confederate tide. This is around three o'clock in the afternoon now. So Lieutenant Potts reports in his diary at the end of the day, he reports that the regiment was outnumbered, he believed, by about two to one. And they were probably outnumbered more like three or four to one. Um, so the Iron Brigade at this point is pulling back out of Herb's Woods. They've been fighting since the morning. It's now three o'clock in the afternoon. They're taking casualties and they're being gradually, by weight of numbers, pushed out of that tree line. As they pull back, and as the rest of the brigades begin to pull back, the 151st Pennsylvania, around 460, 450 men by this point, starting to take casualties. Only the 151st Pennsylvania is in this gap here to meet four regiments of Pettigrew's brigade and five regiments from Scales brigade as they as they come forward. McFarlane says in his uh, battle report that there was no way to hold back the enemy with volley fire so he ordered the men to mark their targets and fire as each man could deliver an effective shot. Um, so it's like you know kind of like not quite don't fire until you see the white of their eyes but it's like um, let's not fire in volleys and perhaps waste ammunition um, mark your targets as they come fire when you have a target don't waste your ammunition remember the men are marching into battle with only um, what they carry in their cartridge boxes and if you're firing volley and volley and volley and volley and volley and um, not aiming at specific targets but rather aiming at a mass of men in volley fire um, you might not be using your ammunition to its best effect. And so what he's asking these men to do, these men that you know are supposed to be proficient marksmen coming from farm territory and as farmers that have hunted throughout their early adulthood, he's asking them to mark their targets and use their ammunition in, um, conserve their ammunition and only fire when they actually have something that they can see and something that they can identify as a target. Now the 151st is out there all by itself taking artillery fire and it is taking oblique fire now from brigades that are moving round on its flanks. Lane's brigade of North Carolinians is coming round on one flank, Pettigrew's at its front, and um, Perrin's brigade is also pushing forward against it, and is taking fire on both flanks and to its front, and is now taking heavy, heavy casualties. That 467 men now, uh, McFarlane thinks he lost about half of his casualties out here on this open ground in front of us either holding his position up there on McPherson Ridge or in the withdrawal from McPherson's Ridge back to the seminary here. So McFarlane wrote in his official report, McFarlane wrote in his official report, I know not how men could fight more desperately, have exhibited more coolness or contested the field with more determined courage. So, you know, he was proud of his men and he was proud of the fight that this um, single regiment put up against uh, two brigades there, against Pettigrew's and Scales Brigade. So with the regiments and brigades on their flank falling back and coming under oblique fire from Confederate units and coming around their flanks and they're exposed, they're in danger of being surrounded. I mean if they're flanked and they're surrounded, that's game over for them. They're going to have to surrender en masse. 
an entire regiment would have to surrender. McFarlane does not want to surrender his regiment, he does not want to be surrounded, so he orders a withdrawal back to the seminary. So they've got to come back across these fields, back across this ditch, up the slope rise, up the slight rise to the theological seminary, and they're going to resume their defensive position in that little breastworks that they formed earlier in the day, that line of um, logs and split rails that they formed earlier in the day. They're going to form a defensive line there. And that defensive line, um, they're going to attempt to uh, rally other units as well. So McFarlane says that, you know, there are men from other units that are falling back as well, and this will be a good point to try and rally some of those men. As he attempts to rally those men, um, McFarlane's horse is hit, and McFarlane himself is hit, uh, wounded badly through both legs, and is now down and out of command of the regiment. Um, he is wounded so badly that um, uh, subsequent to the battle, his right leg will have to be amputated, and his left leg was so badly shattered that it will, even a year later, still be causing him trouble. So McFarland is now out of action. He will be captured and taken as a wounded prisoner and held in Libby prison until 1864, until he's paroled. But um, command of the regiment now falls to Captain Owens, um, commander of D Company. So it falls to a company commander. There are no field officers left. It has to fall to a company commander. Somebody has to step up, and that's Captain Owens. And he rallies some troops there, um, some of the 151st, some of the 142nd Pennsylvania, some men from the Iron Brigade, so um, 24th Michigan, 19th Indiana, also rally with him in this small defensive position. But it's an isolated position. They're under heavy, heavy attack. The rest of First Corps is withdrawing into the town and will then subsequently try and withdraw up onto Cemetery Hill. And this is the rear guard. This, the 151st, this small little group of men here, what's left of them, are holding off effectively the whole of AP Hill's Corps from overrunning the retreat of First Corps. Now, that's a difficult position to be in, and as it has been said, um, the men here, the Union men here, they fell like ripe apples in a storm. So if you go to an apple tree and you shake it and see how the apples fall from that, that's the the way in which the casualties fell with such ease and rapidity here, which is a terrible ease that they fell, the casualties here as well. So at this point the 151st is down to below half of its strength, it's down to below um, probably around 200 men or so are trying to hold out on this position here. It's around 4.30 in the afternoon and they are holding this um, brigade here. I'm sorry, they are holding their position here with a small group and Potts says in his diary that they tried to rally some men from the additional regiments, 142nd and some men from the Iron Brigade, um, but they barely held here for half an hour, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you give me half an hour to walk from here, I can probably walk from here to Seminary Ridge in half an hour. I can certainly walk back down into the town centre, around the traffic circle and start making my way back up Baltimore towards there. Now the town itself at this point is in a confusion, an absolute confusion of retreating men. First Corps is retreating and 11th Corps is retreating into the town through those streets. And the streets are crowded with wounded men, retreating men. Um, some men have managed to have some kind of unit cohesion, some company groups to stay together, but others are just individuals making their way back. There are ambulances, there are supply wagons, there are artillery limbers and guns trying to make their way back through. There are loose horses. It's absolute chaos trying to get through the crowded streets of this town as these two Union Corps fall back, 11th Corps from the north and 1st Corps here from the west of town. Added to the confusion, Jubal Early's division of Richard Ewell's Corps coming into the north of the town is actually starting to come into the streets in the north of the town passing through Coons Brickyard and making their way with Johnson's um, division into the town of Gettysburg itself. So Confederate troops are coming into the town and that is adding to the confusion. So the fact that um, the 151st are able to hold this position here for 30 minutes as a rearguard position to give 1st Corps, the other units in 1st Corps, that time to retreat is what enables them to retreat. It's almost a sacrificial action. Think of it when you're playing baseball. Um, you've got a runner on third, you need that runner to come in and you're gonna make a sacrifice bunt. You know you're gonna be out, but you're hoping that that runner's gonna make it in. Or you hit a sack fly, you get that ball in the outfield, 
with them, you're going to be caught, but maybe that runner's then going to be able to come in and score that run. So 151st is making that sacrifice um, to enable the rest of first core to get away. So when the moment comes for when the 151st can hold here no longer, and the regiments, the remnants of the regiment will retreat through the town. Of course, they're going to be one of the last units passing through the town. And a group of them will, as a result of that, be um, captured. Um, a large number of Union troops were captured in the town by Confederates as they moved into the town. So um, men of the uh, 151st will be amongst those captured. So remember, they've taken casualties here on the ground behind me, on McPherson's Ridge and on that open farmland behind me. They've taken casualties here at the Theological Seminary, and now they're being captured. Men are being captured and taken prisoner in the town itself. So when the bloodied and exhausted survivors of the 151st gather on Cemetery Hill and attempt to reform under Captain Owens, who's now in command, as I said, commander of D Company, but command of what's left of the regiment has passed to a company commander. There are no senior officers left. When the remains of that bloody regiment, the 151st, gather there and they check their strength, they came into battle uh, with 467 men, and at that point they only have 92 men left present for duty. Um, some other men will come in um, during the evening and the next morning as uh, they find their way back to their unit. They may have, um, they may have made their escape through Cemetery Hill got, com Hill, got completely lost and not been able to find their unit until later that evening or early the next morning. Um, some men that had lain hidden in the town uh, and moved through the town will, will creep up through the night and through, try and get their way through the, the Confederate lines and up onto the hill. So the regiment does gain a few numbers, but um, at that initially when they reach it, there's only 92 men left out of the 467. So they said McFarland himself, the regimental commander who'd been wounded and captured. Other men have been captured as well. Um, that's particularly devastating when you think of those casualties. As I said it was a nine-month regiment nearing the end of its enlistment, and now they have taken um, what are believed to be the second highest casualties of any Union regiment on the field here at Gettysburg at that time. But the battle wasn't over for them. This wasn't the end of it. This was only the first day of battle. So although they were heavily, heavily engaged on the first day of battle and took significant casualties, there's still two more days of battle to go. Um, the survivors are grouped together with a group of survivors from the 20th New York. They form an ad hoc battalion, as, as, you, as you will. And that ad hoc group of the 151st and 20th New York move to the left centre of the line the next day. So that's July the 2nd. They're in the left centre of the line. Um, that will support the gap that has opened as Dan Sickles moves forward and opens up that gap in the Union line. And then Meade and um, Hancock have to rush troops. Whatever troops they can lay their hands on, like you, go there. You, go there. We have to fill this gap that's opened up thanks to lovely old Dan Sickles. Um, so they are filled in, into this gap, this, this unit. And that puts them in a position on the third day of battle that they are able to then pitch in from their position into the uh, to repulse Pickett's charge. They're engaged again on the third day of battle as Pickett's charge comes in. They're, they're engaged in the repulse of Pickett's charge on the third day. So casualties for the 51st really have to be measured over the entire three-day period of battle. Um, so uh, we know there were 92 men but subsequently there are a few more men come in. But of the 467 men engaged, um, 81 are listed as killed in action, 181 are wounded, so it's a very high number of wounded men. 75, a very large group there, 75 are either prisoners of war known to be captured or missing in action. So it's a total of 337 casualties um, out of 467, so it's around 72% casualties that have been taken. So if you're at work, line up 10 of your colleagues in a row, remove 7 of them, the three you've got left, and that represents, you can now see, or if you're at home, um, line up ten coffee cups and take seven of them away and you've got three remaining. You can see physically with that like little example there of uh, how heavy the casualties were, how heavy that loss was on that day. Um, Major General Doubleday, so had been in command of uh, First Corps on that first day, and he said in his report of the 151st, um, the stand of the 151st at the seminary in particular, enabled him to withdraw 
the rest of First Corps. And he wrote, I believe they saved First Corps and were among the chief instruments to save the Army of the Potomac and the country from unmissable disaster. So um, it would have been if First Corps had completely collapsed and been overrun, um, they probably would maybe not have held Cemetery Ridge that night. Um, so Doubleday is right in his assessment that that last stand, that sacrifice here, um, saved the men of the Corps. So that large number of um, uh, men that were taken prisoner, 75 that were taken prisoner, um, they were at first held um, under, I believe, um, Jenkins Cavalry Brigade, um, which was one of the cavalry brigades that were still serving as a screening force with the Army of Potomac. So we know that Jeb Stewart and the majority of the Confederate cavalry were missing, but Jenkins Brigade is one of the ones here, I believe, screening Ewell's Corps and also taking care of prisoners. So guarding the wagon train, you know, the baggage train for the 2nd Corps, and also guarding any prisoners taken. So the men. Uh, McFarlane notes that he believes that they were um, guarded by the 17th Virginia Cavalry and um, uh, when the Union Army um, regained the field on the 4th of July, so the battle has ended, and um, on the end of the 4th of July when the Confederate Army withdraws from the battlefield, excuse me, I'm going to hydrate. The enlisted men are paroled, immediately paroled because there's just too many people to take with them. But the officers are held in captivity. And um, as I said, McFarland is held for almost an entire year. He's held in five uh, different prisons, including uh, Libby Prison, which is where he ends up, at Libby Prison in Richmond. So the officers remain in custody until they are paroled um, and exchanged, because the exchange value of an officer is high. Whereas the enlisted men that have been captured, uh, particularly as some of those are wounded, like the wounded men would just be left behind in barns and, ha and farmhouses as, and, and left for the Union to find and, and treat because uh, the Confederacy does not want to retreat with them. It's retreating with its own wounded. It does not want to drag wounded prisoners with it, so it leaves those men behind. So 151st Pennsylvania will be able to regain some of its captured men and some of its wounded men as a result of this and bring its numbers slightly more up to strength um, in time effectively for it to be mustered out. As I said, it was a nine-month regiment. It's coming to the end of its enlistment, and the discharges will begin at the end of July. So by the 27th of July, a lot of the men that fought here, the survivors of this battle, um, the wounded men that fought here, um, the now parole prisoners that have fought here, and the men that would survive and continue to fight through the three days, those men will begin to be discharged and returned to their homes. So Gettysburg is the bloodiest engagement that they will, fought, that they will have fought in during their nine months of service and is also the last engagement that they will have fought in during their nine months of service. So that effectively is the story of the 101st Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment, known as the School Teachers Regiment, as I said, not at the time, um, but subsequently known as the School Teachers Regiment um, because of the number of um, school teachers and uh, teacher students um, particularly from um, McAusterville Academy, um, that D company comprised almost entirely of faculty and students from the academy. Um, so it is said that um, spread throughout the regiment there were anything from between 60 to 100 school teachers and when looked into by researchers in the 1930s that's when the regiment acquired its nickname so it did not have that nickname at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg it was simply 151st Pennsylvania and it's subsequently become known as the school teachers regiment um, so if there are any school teachers watching and particularly history teachers hi um, you know it feels like this means something to us as school teachers and as history teachers that we're talking about a battle and we're talking about the history of a battle in which school teachers and history teachers participated. Um, we're not talking about professors of Bowdoin College, um, we're talking about what would now be middle school and high school teachers. So kudos to those men for fighting here at Gettysburg and uh, that nickname, the School Teachers Regiment, should be one that you remember, the 151st Pennsylvania. So that really concludes the tour today. As I said, um, this was going to be a live stream tour, 
um, but Verizon coverage can be a little spotty on the battlefield. Um, it doesn't always depend on whether you're in um, open ground, low ground or high ground. I've been in um, some horrible ground here down at South Cavalry Field where Farnsworth was and I've had perfect, perfect cell reception. And I've been at places on top of Cemetery Hill which is uh, significantly highest part of the, of the battlefield um, with no real obstructions to me and had no service at all. So, um, you know, cell service can be uh, very random here and particularly cell data service can be very random here. So we were unable to get uh, network connectivity stable network connectivity earlier this morning and that resulted in having to drop the live feed unfortunately and um, but it's okay because a train in the railroad cut not the six not the six Wisconsin but a CSX freight train in the railroad cut <laughs> so here's the thing when I came here and I do the six Wisconsin tour and we, if anybody comes with me we and uh, we walk across to the railroad cut I mean, at the time, that was just a cutting and the railroad had not been laid. And it is now an actual active railroad and there's a CSX train, freight train, pulling through the railroad cutting at the moment. Um, when I've been with people and we've been talking about um, Rufus Stores making that charge uh, against Davis's brigade and um, actually coming to the railroad cut and fighting at the railroad cut, one of the things I will do, very naughtily, is trespass on the CSX line. I will climb down the embankment and onto the railroad cut into the railroad line itself. Um, there's not often um, traffic coming through and so you can climb down into the railroad cut and you can see the position that the Confederate infantry were in and how at the same time that it's a defensible position because you can use the embankment as a parapet it's also a terrible division position to defend um, once you've expended your musket fire and you have empty muskets and suddenly Union troops appear on the top of the parapet with loaded muskets. So that's why we climbed down into it. It's very naughty, very dangerous. I usually put a high-vis jacket on so that I can be seen, but please don't do that. I mean, I'm an idiot and a professional idiot, perhaps. But anyway, there's a train passing through the railroad car at the moment. Anyway, I got, I got diverted. So this was going to be a live stream tour. Um, it's now a recorded tour. I will um, obviously save this, upload it to um, the Facebook page and place the live stream tour. I'll also upload it to the YouTube feed. So thank you for bearing with me on the tour today and the uh, recording of that. Um, other events coming up next week. I think we're back and we'll be over on um, Culp's Hill on... Um, August, oh my gosh, October the 5th, we're already going to be moving into October. So October the 5th will be over on Culp's Hill to the other side of town and we'll be talking about the 2nd um, Maryland CSA, so the Confederate Maryland Regiment that fought on Culp's Hill, particularly their actions on the second day of battle. So that's next week's tour, back at, back at Gettysburg, 2nd Maryland CSA. Um, additional tours and the events are all listed on the Facebook page, we list the events there. So that's facebook.com slash walking the ground um, to support me and support the work that we do and these free live stream tours that I try and provide. Um, uh, like and subscribe and all that kind of good stuff to the Facebook page, um, the YouTube feed, Walking the Ground, the Twitter feed, at Walking Ground. Um, so all of those social media accounts. Um, like them, follow them, share them with your friends, particularly if you have friends interested in um, history, um, friends that are interested in the Civil War, um, just friends that might be interested in watching a live stream during their lunch break. Um, share with them and uh, uh, you know, thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much for joining the live streams. When I have the live streams, thank you for the views of the, of the videos that I'm uploading. Really do appreciate that. Appreciate the followings on social media as well, um, the likes on this page, the, the people that follow on Twitter, um, the people that have watched the YouTubes, um, even the people that have found me on TikTok goofing around being a history teacher on TikTok, which is not quite battlefield stuff, but even those people that found me on TikTok. Um, so thanks for supporting me on there. As I say, these tours, these um, Tuesday tours are always going to be free. I don't charge for these whatsoever. Um, if anyone is interested in an in-person tour of somewhere like Antietam, 
uh, Fredericksburg, um, Malvern Hill, Seven Pines, any of those battlefields. Um, just let me know. Um, I, I do not charge an arm and a leg. I basically charge uh, gas and coffee money um, because I'm glad to come out and do these tours. So very, very reasonable rates if you want a battlefield tour from a, a particular location. And uh, we never do um, paid tours here at Gettysburg. It's not something that I do. Um, as you know, Gettysburg has licensed battlefield tours and um, they are the guys that um, are licensed to provide tours here that are ch and pay and people pay for those tours um, so um, I don't tread on their toes I just provide these tours for free if you like the content um, and you really do want to uh, support me you want to buy me a coffee and I literally will spend the money on coffee um, I have a coffee page ko hyphen fi coffee get it it's some kind of like pun that they use for coffee.com and I'm like walking the ground on there. I'll post the link to that on the Facebook page. But you can buy me a, you can literally buy me a three dollar coffee, and I will go to Dunkin' Donuts with your three dollar donation, and I will buy myself uh, extra large Dunkin' Donuts, uh, hot original two creams. And uh, I really do spend that money on um, coffee. I'm not going to make a, uh, I'm not going to make a fast living from battlefield tours. Let me tell you that. Which is why mostly I'm doing them on Tuesdays, my day off from the real world. Um, so. Uh, Battlefield Tours is my side interest and something that I'm really doing for fun. As I say, I'm happy to do this for, for coffee. I'm happy to do this for gas mileage and coffee. So I really do, you know, really want to thank the people that have supported me on uh, coffee over the time. And I've uh, uh, got a few donations on there now and, and drunk a good few cups of coffee thanks to you guys. So if you want to support me with a $3 coffee, that's where I am. Um, but thank you for tuning in. Thank you for following and liking on the social media channels. Please pay attention on the Facebook page for upcoming tours. I will always be posting those. Um, so I have a tour coming up next week from Culp's Hill, October the 5th. Um, I've already got some tours scheduled on that page for November. My goodness, November. There's a Halloween tour up on there as well. We're going to have a fun Halloween tour. Um, try and do something fun from Antietam. Uh, twilight on Halloween itself um, but the week after next I will not be at Gettysburg I will be hmm somewhere west of the Mississippi shall we say and I may be on a battlefield and it may have something to do with the 7th Cavalry I may be taking a battlefield tour out that way um, and so seeing how that goes so if I pop up on uh, a random live, uh, live stream where I pop up on a short video that I've posted um, from Montana then <laughs> uh, by now some of you will have probably guessed what I'm talking about but um, I'm heading out for a short break to the west and uh, meeting up with uh, my son and we're going to be doing uh, some uh, Indian Wars battlefield touring out there so nothing organized but I may um, shoot a couple of short video clips and upload those just for fun so that could be coming in a week or so so thanks for tuning in today thanks for supporting walking the ground really do appreciate the support hope you enjoyed the tour today and hope you enjoyed the talk about 151st pennsylvania and that you will keep the school teachers regiment in your heart and that you will also keep history teachers in your heart um, because lord knows we do what we can with what we have available thank you guys